Hey, what's going on, Access Analyze community? This is Vic Weezy here, and today I'm going to go over a video on optimal moves for round one. And of course, this is my opinion. And the allies, uh, I'm going to focus on going KGF, which is kill Germany first. So we're going to go to Hot Seat, where I'm going to be playing myself. I'm going to set up a game titled YouTube. I'm going to do the Larry Harris setup, which is the same as ranked, and we're going to go low luck to help ensure that there's no uh, anomalies. So everything kind of stays in the standard deviation there, normal standard deviation. My buy is four infantry, two tanks. You'll see a lot of top allied players do this buy, and for good reason. The two tanks help dead zone Corellia. And they at least make Germany commit more troops to Corellia if they're able to stack it next turn, making them more inefficient in other battles. For example, this German tank in Poland, if Russia has pretty good results, it will need to go up to Corellia to help ensure better odds for Germany. So that makes the, an attack in Ukraine a little bit more inefficient. Maybe Germany has to risk some fighters. So everything is a domino effect in this game. And we're gonna and a good rule of thumb is so we know infantry is the best unit in the game. If we're purchasing anything other than infantry, we need to ask ourselves why. And so we can answer that question with the two tanks because they're dead zoning Corellia. We're doing a standard 12-9 attack here. And we're gonna click on West Russia combat first, and then we'll go to Ukraine. And the purpose of that is if we have a really good West Russia, like a near perfect West Russia, or a perfect West Russia, then we can strafe Ukraine if it's a very good strafe. Nine out of ten times, though, we're going to want to push through and capture Ukraine for some much needed space between Russia and Germany. It's important to note that my German bomber is set to die first. I kind of bounce back and forth between having it die first or having it die after infantry. I really don't think there's too much of a difference there. But if we were to go optimal, I would say have the G German bomber die first, which I have it set up here. By having the German bomber die first, this gives Russia technically the lowest chances of capturing Ukraine at 76%. If the bomber dies after infantry, it's a 78%, so a 2% increase. If the bomber is after artillery, it's 79%. I do understand the reasoning for having the bomber after infantry or even artillery, and that's more for the outliers. So if Russia has a very strong West Russia, and then they attack Ukraine and do a very good strafe, you more or less want Russia to go on through and not dead zone uh, Ukraine so well and, keep, and preserve all their units. You want them to expose their tanks and try to get a more volatile battle. The same is true on the flip side. If Russia has a really poor Ukraine battle. Maybe that bomber survives because it's set after artillery. Having that bomber survive can be a nightmare for the allies because the bomber can go one, two, three, four, hit Egypt, land back in Libya or Algeria. And the, uh, Germany can go and have odds on clearing out Egypt. And clearing out Egypt will provide less units for India to defend on a critical round three timing that Japan normally goes for. After our 12-9 attack, we've lost three infantry in West Russia, which is slightly below average, and two, losing two infantry is slightly above average, so there's kind of no uh, exact number that's an, an exact average. In Ukraine, we have a common uh, scenario that pops up. Do we keep these nice three shiny Russian tanks, or do we uh, push forward and try to conquer the, the territory? So take a minute to think about that. What do you think? Should we retreat or press on? Also, re remember, we want to dead zone Ukraine, and Germany can bring in fighters as well. So again, this is what the map looks like. We know that Russia will have a total of six tanks, one in West Russia, two mobilized in Moscow, three that retreat back to the Caucasus. Russia will also have two artillery and two fighters that can help dead zone. And we have a total of 10 infantry, four in the Caucasus, six in West Russia. Germany 
can bring seven, eight infantry by transport. Germany can also bring in six tanks, including one by transport. Germany can also bring in four fighters and not risk a C Zone 7 attack and still attack with six. Or Germany can bring one of these two fighters back in either Northwest Europe or in Norway and land it in Ukraine to um, give better odds. So let's take a minute, let's take a look at what the math has to say about that. Here is the math for the attack Russian 10 infantry, two artillery, six tanks, two fighters versus eight infantry, six tanks, and four fighters. And the attacker profit would be at almost negative 10 and with a 37% chance. We decided to press through because of the math. We didn't want Germany to be able to stack Ukraine. Bring an AA gun in here makes these German fighters in Poland and in Bulgaria work for having to retake or clear out Ukraine. They will now be subjected to a gunfire. One fighter will go to uh, the Caucasus to help bolster the defense there. So there will be four infantry mobilized with one fighter there. And this will help ensure any kind of, uh, if Germany decides to go for a risky battle such as grabbing an infantry and tank and attacking with two fighters in a battleship. It'll be about four with a bombardment versus uh, five units. So pretty risky battle there. I'm going to bring the A gun in West Russia. If you have a pretty good West Russia, um, that will help deter Germany from trying to get lucky and strike West Russia. You could also probably drop it in Caucasus if you are really afraid of that. Um, attack by the battleship but uh, in all my games I drop it in West Russia. One fighter goes up to Ark. From Ark they can hit and reclaim clear out C-Zone 5, the German transport that usually lives there. They can also attack East and help clear Bury if Japan takes it very lightly and there's not another good attack. And of course this can hit two spaces away so it's got a lot of uh, options here. And options are a very important thing to keep open, especially in the early rounds of play. You want to be able to adapt to how your opponent's playing and play the optimal lines. This sub will go to C Zone 7 to try to punish um, if Germany tries to do a 5 1 split and attack C Zone 10, or if Germany tries to do a 4 1 1 split where they try to go 4 here, 1 in C Zone 10, and 1 in C Zone 11. Two troops will move to uh, Avinki, oh, to Archangel from Avinki, and they'll help dead zone Karelia. Uh, this troop in Kazakh will move to Sheshwan, Sheshwan baby, and in Sheshwan, um, this will give the UK flexibility to be able to land in Sheshwan if need be, or to do another errand. And then the other units will move west. And you, I'm going to put one in Bury. You could put two in Bury, but it, uh, if your opponent does not attack Pearl, they can really get a, they can really kill these two infantry pretty easily. So I just like to put one in there to kind of balance out Pearl. So if they go Pearl, it makes this battle dicey. All right, and at the end of the round, this is what the board looks like. All right, it's Germany's first turn. The hallmark of a good player will be to, of a strong access and allies player, will be to look at the board, look at the combats, and try to visualize the combats before actually purchasing any units. Given that it's round one, it's not... Uh, too necessarily important for that because most of the board is um, set up in a way that I played it before. I will look to buy a bomber for a few different reasons. One, it can uh, threaten the UK drop and make UK invest in a destroyer rather than a transport. 
It can also threaten uh, some of these C zones down here, especially C zone 34 if the UK brings a transport over. And it can threaten, you know, Africa and especially Transjordan if the Allies omit and do not kill the battle, German battleship. I'll look to take, uh, take out Ukraine. I can't use this tank in Poland, I don't think, because I'll have to look at the math and see if, I, see if Russia has dead zone Karelia properly. I'll look to stack Karelia, especially if I'm playing a strong opponent, as I don't want um, that opponent to get much more of an advantage than they already have right now. Here's the math for Corellia. It's about a dollar and a half ICP profit with the, almost a 70% chance the attacker survives. But I'm really looking at and paying attention to this attacker profit. I feel like that does benefit the Axis here since starting a little bit behind. If I take out the anti-aircraft gun and add a tank, this attacker profit goes up to about two. So I'm going to keep the AA gun. My buy is seven infantry, two artilleries, and a uh, bomber. The artilleries will give the infantry more offensive power. I'm going to send six to C zone seven. This will help ensure that I really clear out C zone seven with 97% odds, roughly around there. Battleship will attack uh, the destroyer, bringing over infantry supported by artillery, attacking Transjordan to close up the Suez Canal. I could bring an infantry and tank, however that tank is needed more in the European theater. And it gives about the same odds with infantry and artillery as it would be for infantry and tank. I will place one in Karelia just for right now in case things go south in Ukraine. We know that really won't be the case because it's low luck, but there are some swingy low luck battles. I'll bring four infantry and a tank. I can't bring this tank in Poland because it needs to go up to Ukraine or up to Corellia if need be. I will bring in a fighter, so risking it against the AA gun. I know this looks like a little bit of overkill, but if this fighter gets shot down, it does become a dicey battle. So those are my combat. All right, here's Germany's post-mobilization phase. Uh, five fighters have moved to Northwest Europe for a variety of reasons. One, to help dead zone West Russia. So Russia will definitely need some allied air to help um, support defensively here. Two, to attack the uh, C zones, threaten these C zones. Also the peripheral C zones of C zone 3 and 13 as well. Um, so it makes a nice target. One thing to watch out for though is to make sure that you have enough defense for Northwest Europe. So one infantry, one AA gun, five fighters. If the UK were to get ultra aggressive and try to bring a tank, infantry, bomber, two fighters, and a cruiser bombardment, they would uh, probably result in a negative 20 IPC swing, but we'll, let's look at the math really quick. All right, looking at the math of this battle, infantry tank, two fighters bomber, and a cruiser bombardment versus inf anti-aircraft infantry and five fighters will have a negative uh, 20 IPC profit. Defender has a very high chance of surviving. If we scroll down, we'll see that we have three fighters, um, is the norm and at 50% chance we'll have four fighters left so if the UK wants to obliterate their air force there's a pretty good chance of that happening of course you can always get a top 5% uh, disaster result with like one fighter left and then Germany is looking uh, very weak and about to collapse also a shout out to uh, Popovich's uh, calculator I use it all the time um, and he, he's in discord uh, 19, Allies 1942 online Discord community, um, and his calculator is, I think, the best. Going back to the rest of Germany's non-com, four tanks are placed in the Baltic states, and what that does is that puts pressure on West Russia. It also does not allow Russia to do something cheeky like stack Ukraine, because if uh, Russia moves into this space to stack here to gain more profit by trading down Poland and Bulgaria. Well, I can move into Arc Archangel and bring these four these four tanks along with it, and then I'm right on Moscow's doorstep while Russia is uh, one step away and cannot get back to save their capital. So that's a good power move as well. So the Allies have to respect this, and they're pinned to West Russia now, unless they can clear out Karelia. 
but looking at the odds, it's a very dicey battle. And as allies, uh, I don't, I will not go for this in most cases. All right, so the rest of the board, I had to leave Bello empty in this setup um, to help ensure I had better odds to hold Corellia. So that's the domino effect of Russia buying two tanks. It makes um, Germany have to bring everything they have to hold here if there's a normal West Russia result, which there was. So that would be easy to trade for Russia. And then we have our two infantry and a tank. I'm, not, I'm fine with that. Um, Russia will have to invest to trade that. If they go, if Russia trades Karelia, they cannot effectively trade Ukraine. Um, and then this bomber is optimally placed in Italy to reach the sea zones it needs to reach, as well as threatening a UK drop. Okay, I went with a UK fighter buy because I cannot drop um, a fleet in any of these sea zones. If I do, I compromise these fighters from going to West Russia, which they're uh, very badly needed if I do not attack Corellia. You want to plan your turnaround UK. I know Quentin does this for his allied uh, movements. So I'm planning around everything around UK so I gotta look at my Russian attack. I pretty much have to make a decision right now if I'm going to be attacking Corellia or not. So that way I know what I'm doing with UK and then US can follow suit as well. So I've decided to not attack Corellia but to dedicate four units to Ukraine. I'll dedicate two infantry, two artillery to attack Ukraine with two fighters. I'll also have an uh, infantry move into Belarusia. Now I need to know the math. So the math says eight infantry, eight tanks, five fighters, one bomber, and what can I hold with that territory? Well, I know that I've already got four units allocated to go to Ukraine, so I will have uh, 8, 9, 10, 11, 11 minus 1, one unit's going to go to Bellow. So that gives me 10 units, an AA gun, 3 tanks, 2 fighters, Russian fighters, and I need 5 fighters and a bomber to really help hold with 10 infantry, an AA gun, 3 tanks. So these 2 fighters in UK are very much needed to go to West Russia. Also, this fighter in Szechuan, the US fighter, will need to come over to West Russia. To help ensure its safety, I'll um, bring this fighter over to attack Season 61 and then land in Szechuan. Okay, so now that we know what we're going to do with those attacks, and again, I have an infantry and two artillery. Those two artillery give some teeth to India, so that way if Japan tries to do a Burma stack, I can counter it. All right, so we want to make sure that we really clear out Transjordan. I'm not going to... I'm going to omit the battleship attack, so I will, I will not go for the German Bismarck, and I will bring all available units, including two from India, just because it's standard dice, and I really need enough troops to hold Transjordan. I don't want to have to bring this U.S. fighter to help hold Transjordan. I don't want to have to allocate a Russian fighter to come back and hold Transjordan. So, assuming normal hits, We'll have four, five, six. Six ground units minus one should give us five ground units. Germany can hit back with a tank, bomber, infantry, and artillery. That's one, two, three. Three and a bomber plus a battleship. So that feels pretty good to do that. I could also bring this UK fighter up to West Russia if need be. Oh, sorry this UK fighter up to West Russia if need be um, and not land on the carrier and then that gives me the flexibility of US coming over to land in Transjordan or a Russian fighter to hit here and land back in Transjordan so those are some different options alright and then in C Zone 61 we'll send the cruiser and fighter to preserve the aircraft carrier in C Zone 7 we'll attack with a destroyer and cruiser one fighter We'll be, out, we'll be tasked to go to C-Zone 5, and then um, oh, I don't want that fighter to attack because I want that to go to West Russia, so I'm going to leave that be. We can do a double attack and really make sure we kill that transport. Sometimes those transports fire back on the zeros. Then we'll have a bomber attack C-Zone 7. So that's three attacking two. 
Um, and that's three plus four, seven plus two. That's nine attacking power versus a one and a three versus four. So nine versus four with three hit points, I'll take that. All right, what to do with this transport? Um, a lot of times you might see players wait for the infantry to come over. I find that might be a little too passive. You can also grab a tank, drop it in French West Africa. Not a bad play either, but I like to be pretty aggressive with UK. I can kind of afford to trade away some units. So I'm going to grab this tank, drop it in Norway. What this does is two infantry in Finland have to come back and attack Norway. And this just happened in one of my allied games I just did. Um, so two infantry will really want to attack Norway to reclaim it. But that sets up U.S. perfectly to move into C-Zone 10 and then to come into C-Zone 3 and take it back. Even if I lose um, a U.K. transport followed by a U.S. transport, a lot of times players will sack a trans well, some players will sack a transport to take uh, Morocco. I know that this is a, uh, Quentin does this for his allied move. Um, however, I want to bring both these transports up just to give me some more flexibility and then um, to be able to attack uh, Norway. Okay, this is the end of UK's turn. Cruiser and Destroyer survived up here in Season 7, giving allies extra ships to provide coverage. The two fighters and bomber located in West Russia centralized and able to hit multiple sea zones and landing zones. I left the transport unguarded for either Japan or Germany to take to kill. I wanted to protect this aircraft carrier so I was able to bring the fighter back. I was thinking it reconsidering it. I believe I'm going to send I am going to send the US fighter to Transjordan to really beef this up in case Germany uh, wanted to get lucky and get a bunch of hits on Transjordan. If this happens, then Transjordan has a lot less units to go to India, and Japan can really put the pressure on India. Preserving India is very important, very critical to the Allied plan. And everything else looks pretty normal. I did the standard Davinator 3 infantry left behind as he's, uh, as he's patented that. And um, the math is good here in West Russia. As long as I do not, um, as long as I not, do not allocate one infantry to go to Belarusia, I need to keep what I have here, and I can still attack four infantry or two infantry, two artillery, two fighters in Ukraine. Uh, if I go with two infantry and artillery, it gets a little dicier. I want to make sure I capture this territory, and I'll just tank tank blitz this Belarusia. So you kind of see how everything ties in, everything's a, a, a bit balanced, especially in, a, in an even game right here where we've got a close game, 161 and 160. Every unit matters, um, especially if you're uh, playing a player that's going to play the odds as well and not just do some wild, uh, wild ass attacks. The buy for Japan 1 is three transports and infantry and tank. If you know that the allies are going to go KGF, so they're going to kill Germany first. You want to buy three transports to get up to three plus one. So you want to get up to four transports for optimal movement and shipping to the coast. Um, the tank is, I bought a tank so that way I can drop two tanks off in round two in Union and they can blitz down and attack India for round three if that's an option. But that's a big if. I'll leave this transport to be killed for the to be a target for the German bomber. That will allow me to bring um, stack Quatang with five fighters and bring a fighter up to season 60. And then I've already planned ahead all my uh, where all my ships are going to move in non-com, so I know what's going on. In season 60, I'm going to have an aircraft carrier, a fighter, a cruiser. And then for season 61, just a battleship. Season 48 will have a battleship, a sub, and an aircraft carrier. And then this destroyer will be free to kind of move around, and I'll kind of see where I want to put it at the end of the turn. The important thing is, since I'm not going for Pearl, because I believe it's a little too dicey, is I'm going to try to dead zone season 45. So if the U.S. moves their aircraft carrier, destroyer, 
two fighters and a sub along with the UK cruiser and sub to fortify it I can still kill it with the ships that I'm gonna set up alright here are my attacks I wanna make sure I'm omitting Pearl because I wanna make sure that I can get some clean kills along the coast since those units will be the most impactful so three fighters three infantry and a fighter attacking that four infantry a fighter and a bomber to really give it good odds infantry artillery artillery let's bring that battleship down here followed with a transport artillery infantry so that's five there let's go with two infantry and a Burma with fighter support this fighter can also hit Union as well this fighter can help clear out the cruiser along with this fighter if there was another unit in here I would consider bringing another battleship to really absorb those hits and make sure the aircraft carrier and cruiser wouldn't get hits back so everything looks pretty good here the destroyer is free to move anywhere else I've got two infantry versus a fighter here six units six units four units and then I'll be properly dead zoning C zone 45 this is the end of uh, Jay's Japan's turn here notice I have five fighters and a bomber in Quitang and they can go over into the European theater and help out Germany stack somewhere I also have C zone 45 dead zone I decided to move the destroyer into C zone 48 as cheaper fodder to really increase my profit margin if the allies were reckless and try to stack C zone 45 up here I feel confident with an aircraft carrier cruiser and fighter versus two US fighters not only would the US have to clear those ships out but then they have to hit the transports afterwards so they couldn't really have any ties so it's a very very low percentage for the fighters to take out those transports everything else looks pretty good I do like attacking Burma with two infantry if I can that way if India or if uh, the UK doesn't get a hit back then I have two infantry in Burma and then the India bleeds out a little quicker so that's a something I've, I've liked doing as of recently for the US I did the Metabai two infantry two artillery one aircraft carrier two transports it's nice that my Pearl fleet survived um, that is a strong play for Axis if they go for Pearl it's just dicey you know it can go pretty poorly um, if you know I would go for it if I didn't have the lead or I was playing from behind that'd be a good play to catch up but since it's pretty much an even game um, the Axis can play conservative in that regards and really use fighters to go west so the US ha uh, cannot move to uh, season 45 we know that uh, one play that you know Quentin likes to do is sack his transport for uh, Morocco and I was copying that strategy and I'm kind of on the fence if I want to do that or not in most of my games. It does get the U.S. involved quickly, but at the expense of a transport. Now, I know that sounds kind of ironic that I'm sacking a U.K. transport up here and not in Season 13. Um, that's because I don't want to be the sack transport king. You know, I don't want to be sacking everything. Um, no, but the real reason is, I don't, uh, if you know, this transport has a purpose. So, if U.K., Germany kills this transport Germany can retake Norway but then US is just primed to take this back and get a factory here the following round barring that Germany doesn't send tanks this way but if Germany sends tanks this way that's awesome I got an, I have an overreaction from Germany and I'm happy with that as Russia it's also important to make map notes so I'm gonna send uh, this US fighter to Transjordan to help out and I know that I need four fighters here so my Russian fighters must land back in West Russia and I cannot move a unit in Bellow so I'm gonna tank blitz so looking at your map notes is really important as well so pretty much no non uh, no combat moves for uh, US um, to attack to attack Morocco is uh, could be a strong move however I'm not gonna do that for this opening all right at the end of US mobilization phase it looks like this I have two transports up here 
uh, giving me the option to hit and strike back Norway. Sometimes you'll see uh, some players bring their transports up to Greenland and drop off. I'm still in range of the bomber though, which can land back in Finland. And if Germany kills two transports and lands back in Finland, uh, that might be a good play for the Axis. Notice how my U.S. fighters are in position to, to kill the German battleship. Uh, I've got, you know, anything can reach here. So one, two, three, you can hit season 16 as well as this fighter, as well as season 17, 15, it's all dead zoned. And these bombers here. If the battleship decides to go for the fighter for whatever reason, I have my cruiser and destroyer here present, ready to kill that. Uh, I place the map note so I don't forget my U.S. fighter down here, which will go to India next turn. And all the ships went east to go uh, a full KGF. I left the tank up here as well in case uh, Japan wants to go for Alaska. I have an infantry, a tank, and a fighter which should be able to clear that. If they bring two transports, let them. That's, too, uh, that's pretty inefficient. And... Um, Japan needs those units to go pressure India anyways. At the end of the round, it's pretty close. Axis have a slight lead, so I feel like this is a really even game. Here are my thoughts after seeing all the powers in round one. I feel like Russia always, in most cases, needs to take Ukraine and um, place units in there and capture. I feel like Germany is always looking for anything to stack, uh, preferably number one, Ukraine, uh, second, Karelia, um, Belarusia could be a third option, and if none of those, then many stacking all three of these territories. I feel like UK really needs to establish a defense in West Russia if Germany has stacked. If not, UK has the luxury of dropping a fleet. Japan needs to make their plays based on how uh, how they are in the game, if they're behind or um, if it's an even game. So if, it, if they're behind, they can go for Pearl and be more aggressive and try to track down anybody that's trying to preserve their fleet in 33. Uh, but they really need to make sure they kill, the, get clean kills along the coastline because these units will be directly impactful towards Moscow in a, just a few turns. So in just a couple turns, actually. And then for U.S., uh, the U.S. needs to get involved somehow. Um, so sacking a transport from Morocco is not a bad option, but um, you know, just having these transports in range, at least by round two, to um, make Germany move back west and defend the defend the fatherland. Uh, isn't that German fatherland and Russia's motherland? Um, so. That's kind of what U.S. is doing, and U.S. needs to establish what they're doing. They don't the split ocean. I've rarely ever seen work. So either go KGF towards um, Germany or KJF towards Japan. But if going KJF, season 37 should have been an option. Or uh, keeping your um, options open and helping out and dropping a fleet in India. So those are my, my round one optimal moves. I hope you enjoyed this video. Um, I enjoy giving back with AAA content. Um, and I've learned a lot from lots of other people. And also to give a quick shout out to the Discord I'm part of. Access and Allies 1942 online Discord has taught me so much and continues to teach me so much. So I'm very grateful for all the people that make it possible to learn more about the game and so that way I can truly be a, uh, a nerd at this game. Thank you.